And here everyone comes. Y'all come. No, of course not. Um, I'm. I have to go on to this um, Zoom thing, so I will talk to you later. That is very uh, funny. everyone. I'll talk to you in a minute. Uh, okay, I gotta go. Bye bye. Welcome everyone. Welcome everybody. You want to be in the picture? No. no. Great to see okay. everyone's faces. Everyone's tiny okay. little checkerboard faces. Monica. <laughs> We're not faces. And I'm a stage. Oh, okay. uh, hi, Noah. Um, hey, did I hear you're hungry? No, I think that was just the venue. So I, uh, the venue was mute there. everyone. So we yeah, have... maybe we should mute yeah. everyone. <laughs> and then Dory, if you want to unmute yourself, so you can say hi to everyone. There you go. I mean, it's kind of fun hearing what's going on in everyone's living rooms and kitchens. <laughs> it's one of the major, like, weird, fun perks of of doing things this way, right? Uh, um, but welcome you all. We're going to have a really great treat for you tonight with these four readers. Um, just going to give people a chance to arrive and uh, let the, the, the latecomers get in. Um, but welcome. And for those of you who might not know, I think everybody probably knows us that it, that's here, but uh, we are writers in progress. Um, coming up on our 30th year. Can you believe this? Yeah. Um, this fall, it'll be 30 years since I started running Writers in Progress workshops out of my living room over on Holly Street and my little dumpy house with the dirt cellar across from like the heroin den. So <laughs> not there anymore, but um, we've come a long way since then. And um, it's been a really great ride. Some sometimes bumpy, um, but always fantastically enlightening. And I've always just felt so incredibly lucky um, to be part of this community, to do this work, to get to hear all of your stories, to have so many people who also love writing and believe yes. in what we do, because um, it really is kind of a a faith-based community in some weird way. It's like, you know, this is this is what we believe in. We believe in stories. We believe in the power of uh, hearing each other's voices. We believe in the power of language and storytelling to bring us together as a community. And it's really important because writing can be so solitary and is so solitary. And in order to kind of access that deep material, you have to go to a very solitary place, right? But it's also about reaching out, it's about connecting, it's about being heard. Um, and so this act of coming together and hearing one another in person like this is, um, it feels like a completion of a process that really is all about reaching in and it's also about reaching out at the same time. Um, a few years ago, I was blessed to have Emily Lackey, um, wind up in my studio. Emily, how long has it been? Like five or six years? Maybe? Yeah, I think it was 2015, maybe. Yeah. And at the time I, you know, I, things were going okay, but I was kind of bungling along doing everything by myself. And, you know, I had some great instructors and people teaching for me, but um, Emily came into my life and really, you know, became my fabulously talented um, right hand woman who I just don't know what I would do without and she's been a source of joy and comfort and camaraderie and she's also brought this community to the next level um, and it's her writers that we're featuring tonight from her um, Wednesday night or Monday Monday night Monday, and Wednesday, Monday night uh, writing from life group which I hear amazing things about because my husband is in it mm -hmm. um, but tonight's all women, which is exciting too. And I wanted to just start the, the reading tonight by sharing a quote that I found. Um, oh God, now I can't, I'm realizing that I can't pronounce the name of this woman. Um, <laughs> it's so embarrassing. She, I just discovered her. She's a French philosopher um, who 
somebody else might know how to pronounce her last name. Helen C-I-X-O-U-S. Does anyone know how to pronounce her name? Cizo, is that how you say it? Possibly. Anyways, I, I just discovered her. She has these amazing um, quotes and pieces about writing and, and what writing means. And this is a quote from her. She says, by writing herself, woman will return to the body which has been more than confiscated from her, which has been turned into the uncanny stranger on display, the ailing or dead figure, which so often turns out to be the nasty companion, the cause and location of inhibitions. Censor the body and you censor breath and speech at the same time. Write yourself. Your body must be heard. Only then will the immense resources of the unconscious spring forth. So when I found that, I just had a feeling that it was the right quote for this group. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Emily. I know we're all in for a big treat. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Dory. I can't agree more that this that quote that you just read is absolutely perfect for this, this group. Um, I'm so, so, so delighted for this reading tonight. I've been looking forward to it for weeks now. There's a lot of wonderful things that happen in these workshops, especially the recurring workshops that ha happen on a weekly basis. Encouragement, inspiration, confidence building. It's something that's evident week after week. You can see the writers transform. It's such a pleasure to be able to write with these writers. But one of the really magical things that happens every so often in a really great group is that it's not only about what they themselves are producing, but they care so deeply about each other and each other's progress and each other's work. And I can say that without a shadow of a doubt, these writers tonight support each other in that really special and magical way. And I'm so excited you shared that quote, Dory, because one of the fun things that happened during our rehearsal is there are these sort of threads and commonalities in these pieces that you'll be witness to tonight. So I'm excited for you all to, to hear these. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the readers tonight. I'm going to start with Victoria. Our lovely Victoria grew up in the world of arts dance, theater, and later TV and film, with writing as one of her earliest loves. She says the platinum lining of this last two years has been the writing community she is lucky enough to be involved in. She thanks Dory and Emily from Writers in Progress, Patricia Lee Lewis, Jacqueline Sheehan, Julie Maloney of Women Reading Aloud, and Jane Mortifee. Victoria lives in Vancouver, beautiful British Columbia, with her British Marmite loving husband, Ian. She is sharing a chapter from one of her stories, Life is a Cabaret. And Victoria, if you, perfect, thank you. Thank you, Emily. <clears throat> this was my favorite time of the evening. From down the hall, I could hear the finale song just beginning to be performed. It was a ballad and Tate was belting it out. I could imagine her arm rising above her head, the last note being accentuated by her hand clenching into a fist, punching the sky and her head falling back. Freeze, lighting cue, blackout. When this happened, explosive applause and yelling followed and the ignited audience stood up clapping. The lights would come back up and the cast would do their choreographed bows. Chorus came out first from stage right and stage left. Then the supporting actors. Gradually, the most important performers came out and bowed. Tate was last. She was the star. The audience went berserk. Tate bowed humbly to the audience, lifted her head up and motioned with her sweeping arm a thank you and acknowledged the orchestra. Then all the cast members rejoined Tate in a long line. They stepped forward as one unit, right foot, left foot, bow, hold 100, 200, 300. They lifted up their bowing bodies, more applause. 
I had time. I went over to where Tate sat and around her large mirror were bright lights the size of Christmas balls and many cards taped around them. Where she sat was always the most crowded with vases of flowers and admirer clutter. I picked up her act one wig, removing it from a white styrofoam mannequin head. Someone had put red lipstick on the mannequin's lips. There was a scarlet boa wrapped tightly around the mannequin's neck. I had to look closely to see what the black tear was under one of her eyes. It was a tiny wastika. I placed the black bob on my head over my pulled up hair. I opened my mouth, licking my upper lip slowly with my tongue, poking it out and curling it in deliberately. I mouthed the words, welcome, bienvenue, welcome, in cabaret, au oh cabaret, to cabaret. I picked up Tate's hairbrush and pulled out some strands of her auburn hair. I rolled them between my thumb and finger into a thin stem, like rolling a cigarette from a paper and tobacco. I put it in my pant pocket. I smelt the hairbrush before returning it to the counter, floral and sweaty. Tate's long, thick hair was tied up for hours under her wigs. I looked at myself in the mirror and copied the little hand movement Tate did during this musical number. Her arm reaching into the audience and her index finger seductively urging them to come with her. I was exhilarated and felt the imaginary warm blinding spotlight on me. I could see the dark audience, just heads and upper torsos lined up in rows. They were all looking at me, smiling, wanting me, wanting to touch me all over with their hands, wanting me to be theirs. They either wanted me or wanted me to be them. Isn't that why audience love performers? They fall in love with them and it makes them fall in love with themselves. It makes the audience feel. I grabbed my breasts with splayed hands and squeezed them in and out. My hips and pelvis hitting the beat of the music in my head. I started slow, but the rhythm became faster and frenzied until I knew I had to stop. I ripped the, whip, the wig off my head and threw it on the mannequin and ran to the other side of the large garment rack that separated the dressing room. Just as the door swung open and screaming, laughing cast shoved into the dressing room. I was feeling shaky. I normally time myself better. I normally heard the orchestra playing the reprise for the bows. I normally knew the exact minutes I had before the cast returned to the dressing room. After a few minutes, when I knew all was safe, I looked through the costumes to the other side. They couldn't see me. All Tate and Maddie could see was their reflection in the large wall mirror. They knew why audiences loved them. They loved themselves. The dressing room was so loud with all the women singing and yelling and laughing. What a fucking awesome audience. I thought we'd have to do another bow, except for the old codger in row two. Either he was taking a nap or had had a heart attack. I could see only the backs of Tate and Maddie but I could see the fronts of them, their faces and upper bodies in the mirror's reflection. Tate had only a towel wrapped around her waist. Her back was so delicate, bones protruding through her pale skin. Her arms were almost the size of a blue heron's legs. Maddie was wiping off her stage makeup with a cold cream. Her skin was being pulled like taffy, the Kleenex smeared with red and black streaks. Her face looked like a Japanese watercolor. I could see the trace of a large tattoo on the base of Tate's neck. It was mostly covered with makeup to hide it. The director forbade tattoos to be visible, saying in theater, your character must be believable and authentic. So why limit and label yourself? The name Metallica that Tate had to tattooed on her neck didn't exactly exist in 1930 Berlin. Berlin. I agreed with the director, skin is a story. It has its own story. So why smudge its innocence with ugly indelible marks? I had tattoos all over my back, black ink. I didn't matter. I wasn't beautiful. And besides that, no one would ever see them. I pretended to play with the costumes, checking their buttons and zippers ready for quick changes. 
Through the thick, hot noise, I saw Tate stand up and yell something about her wig, who'd been touching it and why. I immediately froze behind one of the costumes, a heavy winter coat. Tate was looking around the dressing room. The room had become quiet and she started walking around the garment rack. Just as she was cornering the room to where I was standing, the dressing room door opened right in front of her. Philip, the stage manager, burst in carrying a stack of white elephants. Elephants, envelopes. Hello, my pretties, it's payday. One by one, the cast left the dressing room. I kept very small until Tate and Maddie had gone. The old lady who plays Fraulein Schneider was the last to leave tonight as she was every night. She was fussing with her theater makeup, tubes and compacts. After every show on Saturday, the last show of an eight show week, Betty cleaned all her sponges and brush brushes with alcohol and placed them in an orderly sleeping position. The theater was dark for Sunday and Monday, so she wouldn't see them for two days. She sharpened her black eye and lip liners and placed the tops on carefully, repositioned her Kleenex box and jar of cotton balls. She watered the little plant that was a gift for opening night. Sadly, this dressing room corner was probably her only shrine of who and what she had done with her lengthy years. The little plant still had a bow on it. Betty Hopkins was now 78. Work offers came less seldom to her, but she always painstakingly reminded herself that someone had to play old women. She believed makeup was not enough. These roles must be played by real seasoned veterans, actors that had been in the trenches of feeling, understanding, and portraying real life. I finished up hanging all the costumes and placed the ones for cleaning in the laundry bag. I said to Betty, good night, see you Tuesday. She replied, oh, oh, thank you, dear. What, what's your name again, Mary? Melody? I replied, Mercy. My name is Mercy. Betty answered with a wink, don't do anything I would do. I forced a half smile and felt sad and thought, theater is no place for aging performers. No one wants to be around the obnoxious beauty of youth when you are wilting, when your nectar has all but dried up. I left Betty sitting in the corner, staring at herself in her mirror, grabbed the costume bag and walked to the laundry room. I balanced the bag on my arm and returned and turned the door's handle. It was locked. No one locks the laundry room door from the inside. I knocked loudly. I could hear muffled laughter from inside. I knocked heavily again and said, open the door, I work here, please let me in. The door cracked open. There was Tate and Maddie adjusting their coats and nervously wiping their noses. Tate said, oh, it's you, Miss Mute Weird Girl, the one who snoops around the dressing room when it's empty. Maddie laughed and licked her finger and cleaned up the rest of the white powder off the top of the machine washing machine. She pushed by me, knocking the laundry bag out of my arms. The heavy heap of clothes fell onto the ground. Tate laughed and started to walk on and over the laundry bag to the door. Tate was so close to me. Her eyes were bright and alert with a frozen fleck of fear in them. She purred out, oh, mercy on me. I trust whatever you think you saw happening in here stays in here. And if not, I'll know how the director found out. Not a pleasant thought, Mercy. Actually, things would definitely end up merciless. Don't you know? I know it's your shadowy self that plays with my wig every night. I was terrified, and yet here I was, standing so close to Tate. She was close enough to touch. I boldly wanted her to like me. I opened my mouth and quietly said, you know, I am the one that alters your costumes every week. I have to take them in almost an inch. Your body, it just can't keep disappearing. Why do you do this to yourself? You have everything, everyone wants to be you. I held my breath and wasn't sure what Tate was going to do. Her jaw was marble, but her eyes softened slightly. She dropped our gaze, grabbed her coat lapels and overlapped them, hugged her bony body tightly and walked out. I gathered myself and the laundry and returned to the dressing room. Oh, 
love it. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, Victoria. Stunning, stunning piece. I wrote a note to you all in the chat, but if you have questions along the way, feel free to put them in the chat for the writers and the readers. We'll um, have a Q&A at the end. I have a lot of questions that I'm going to be adding to the chat after that piece. Um, all right, next up, Amelia Perkins. Amelia's writing has appeared in Dirty Words, a literary anthology of sex, the Harvard Divinity School Bulletin, and the one and only literary edition of the Canadian Journal of Psychoanalysis. She does intuitive spiritual coaching and also leads workshops for women and couples focused on the healing power of pleasure. She lives in Heath, Massachusetts with her new hubby. Everyone welcome Amelia. Sweet. Thank you. I'm going to be reading off the screen, so I hope that's not creepy. So um, this is from a story called There Are Many Names for God, Tour of a Religious Imagination. As a child, everything I understood about God was intimately tangled with my mother. It was from her that I got my first tastes of holy wildness and mystery. And unlike other mothers I knew, it was clear she'd actually met God firsthand, up close and personal. In divinity school, I learned that the 99 names for God represent infinite names and qualities of the divine. I also learned that the religious imagination can be a mysterious and unruly place. Part one, God the eternally creative and rejuvenating one. By the time I was five, it was just us, mom and me living in Florida. When mom wasn't reading tarot cards at the Greek sponge docks in Tampa, telling the tourists fortunes, she would make giant stained glass windows or lie for hours in the bathtub or by the pool. We were writing and planning to star in our own play in which my mother, babysitter, and I played orphaned sisters. I was advocating for my character to be deaf mute. I was obsessed with deaf mutes at the time and had trouble fitting them into games with children my own age. My co-stars wanted it to be a musical, but we were sure we could find some middle ground. As the deaf mute youngest sister, I would dance my parts. My mom came up with a lot of ideas that we would embrace with total gusto for a time and then forget entirely. At one point, we decided we would move to India and become belly dancers. She was sure we could make a bundle as exotic Westerners. I had pudged out that year after the divorce and one of the selling points for India was that, according to my mother, a bit of chub was a sign of class there, a mark of beauty. My mom threw a lot of parties and I was always invited. By the time I was six, I discovered Mae West and Gypsy Rose Lee. When company came over, I would go into my mother's closet and choose something wonderful. We both preferred costumes to regular clothes. I would put on my blonde shag wig and long black gloves from the Salvation Army. Then I'd perform for the guests shimming my shoulders and slipping off one glove at a time in a slow motion strip tease singing, let me entertain you, let me make you smile. I can do a few tricks, some old and then some new tricks. I'm very versatile. Periodically over my childhood and adolescence, my mother would say, you're old enough to hear this now. And she would tell me again the story of her nervous breakdown. How she'd been at Esalen doing a gestalt workshop with Dick Price. How she made passionate love in a hot tub with a man she barely knew. How she found herself set free in a world she didn't recognize where everything was ablaze with light and color. How she'd seen Jesus's face coming toward her through the sky getting closer each day until his face met her face and his eyes became her eyes. She said her eyes glowed so much that people thought she'd become enlightened. When she got home to us, my father, brother, and me, a fiery angel walked beside her. 
and over and over she tore a crown of thorns from her head. As a kid, I saw it like this. My mother had communed with Jesus and had the same cosmic appeal as Gypsy Rose Lee. She had gone outside the known world in the mental hospital, touched God and returned to be my mama. And so when we sat around in our bikinis, reading tarot cards or shit, singing show tunes or practicing our Miss America speeches, we did it with the knowledge that the fabric of the world is shimmery, not solid. And, it, and at any time you can slip through and everything can be entirely different. Part two, God, the all-consuming one. I have to admit there is a part of me that imagines God like this, lying on the couch in the, in the dark, in a pretty slinky nightgown, smoking cigarettes and telling stories. While I dressed and undressed my Barbies, my mother would tell the story of losing her virginity, how her parents didn't support her art, how my father couldn't please her and only wanted to have babies. There were the stories themselves and then there was using the stories as a kind of divining tool. Because she would tell the same stories over and over, I would interpret the tiny changes she made. And that way I could get a sense of how our lives were going and whether there were happy times or difficult times ahead. I considered this form of divining to be one of my greatest skills. These stories occupied a good portion of my inner world. I was particularly taken by the idea that my mother had the best sex of her life and then Jesus came to her and she ended up in a mental hospital. This equation of great sex leads to God, leads to craziness, lodged itself in my psyche, a little puzzle or map to be quietly mulled for years. Part three, God, the bright darkness, the absent one, the emptiness that fills all things. There is another slightly older part of me that imagines God like this, away for days in her tent in the woods, making art, deep in the act of creation. I ignore God while she's away, go to friends' houses for dinner. If God doesn't remember me, I act like I don't remember her. I'm not good at faith. It's been hard for me to feel God's presence when God isn't palpably there. But then suddenly God is back and trains her full attention on me with an intensity usually reserved for adults or lovers. If God has a lover, she is absent. She might be present in the house, but I can see all that wild and passionate attention is trained elsewhere. This can last for weeks or months. The husbands and lovers don't last and God is eventually back and I take her acting as if she was never gone. As a child, I'd look at the empty fridge and wonder, does God think about me when she isn't with me? Does she even remember me when she's gone? And then suddenly she'd be back saying, you're my greatest love. You're so perfect. Sometimes I feel like I dreamt you. Part four. God, the eternally ripe, the beloved, the all voluptuous. It strikes me that God, like my mother, is wildly creative and fecund, almost sexy. God certainly has a sense of humor, a flair for the dramatic. Does anyone else have a tingly suspicion that there is something erotic at the center of the universe? the bump and grind of molecules, the heat of creation, an eros that pulls one something to another something to make a third. My mother once said, I could have been married a hundred times there were so many men. She prided herself in being irresistible, a hot mama, the ultimate woman. She'd take a long suggestive suck on her popsicle and say, what can I say? When you've got it, you've got it. What a woman, men would say. Part five, God, the mystery, the revelation. In college, I created my own degree, which I called religion and the body. 
I was fascinated by the descriptions of late medieval women mystics who had a very bodily relationship with Christ. They explored his intestines. He visited them in bed like a lover. They received his foreskin as the Eucharist and it tasted as sweet as honey. It wasn't until years later that I realized, so obvious it's almost embarrassing, that these were the images I had grown up with. My mother was a woman who, in one tangled, delicious, disorienting leap, had met God in her own erotic body, practically in the same breath. Part six, God, the homecoming. Sometimes it feels like childhood was a fairy tale or a book of the Old Testament, complete with angels, dark woods, demons, revelations, and direct contact with God. Becoming an adult was like waking from a dream or coming out of a dark wood where magic lives alongside strange and inexplicable dangers. Take, for example, the story I heard many times during my childhood. My mother bereft, walking with me and my brother through the woods. A fiery angel walks beside her. Over and over, she tears a crown of thorns from her head. One day, not so long ago, something shifted and I realized that I am a part of the story. It had never occurred to me to wonder, what was my experience walking beside her? What was my older brother's experience? At first, I found myself wondering, was I scared of the fiery angel? What did I think of my mother tearing a crown of thorns from her head? I had been so inside her story that it took me a while to realize that most likely I had not seen those things. I wish I could ask my brother. Just four years older, that little bit more consciousness and memory would help to unlock the story. But this at least was finally revealed. I was also there. I was a part of the story. It is also my story. And in that moment of realization, I felt God remember me. I was no longer looking from the outside, but standing at the center of my life, an arrival to where I'd been all along. Amazing, amazing. Beautiful work, Amelia. Thank you so, so much. So much. Oh, didn't I tell you all you were in for a real treat? I meant it. All right. Next up is Elena Azoni. Elena's writing has appeared in the Huffington Post, Elle Magazine, Feminist Anthology, We Don't Need Another Wave, and other online outlets. Her memoir, A Year Straight, which is delightful by the way, was published by Seal Press in 2011. Elena holds an MFA from New College of California at BA from UMass Amherst. And while all of this sounds very fancy, she spends most of her time working, parenting, and picking up her dog's poop. Elena. Thank you, Emily. So, hi everyone. Just a quick note. On Tuesday at the rehearsal, I brought a bunch of stuff about motherhood and death and all of my co-writers were like, uh, where's all the juicy stuff that I'm usually reading? <laughs> and I was feeling shy, but due to popular demand, you're going to get the juicy stuff tonight. So these are six excerpts, small pieces from a collection I'm calling The Lawlessness of Attraction. The first one is called That Summer I Began to Notice Women. First, it was Trish. Back then, the butches I knew were Jen's and Michelle's with shaved heads dyed blue, big chunky boots, tattoos. Trish offered me rides to school. Love will tear us apart blaring through her blown out speakers. She'd always open the door for me, my boyfriend's best friend. The sky promised more through the cracked windshield of her heavy sedan, Chevy sedan. Freudian slip, like anything was possible. She had a girlfriend back in New York and many admirers. One day we pulled up in front of my boyfriend's house and I didn't get out of the car. Trish's knee resting against the door, thick camel cigarette hanging from the corner of her lip, one hand on the steering wheel. 
always only one hand. The smoke wafts over me and I don't mind. If she said something sarcastic in her raspy voice, I don't hear it. It would be months before our first kiss, a drunken stumble into a bathroom at some party. But sitting in the driveway that day, I had no name for what I was feeling, only the curious longing to linger. By the time I broke up with my boyfriend, Trish had a different girlfriend and then another. Years passed and then our paths crossed again at the Dyke March in San Francisco. We fell into each other, this time a tango. Her hands under my hoodie, our lips, the sky, a sea of bodies walking by, bumping into us, but not tearing us apart. This next one is called gravity. We are silent for a solid minute. Am I too naked, you ask, donning nothing but a bandana on your head? No, this is how I roll at home, I reply, wearing nothing at all. We stand in the silent house, pondering takeout, as your cupboards are also bare. Without warning, I mutter, actually, I'm a little bit too naked. I leave the kitchen and head for my clothes strewn across the bedroom floor. You follow me. Why, you ask. I pick up my dress. Because of stupid insecurities, I say, I hate the way gravity, and I'm cut off by your hands on my waist and your mouth on mine. We fall into each other, and right then we start up again for the third time, our hunger for each other greater than any craving for pizza or Thai. We are sideways somehow, feet still on the ground. You are part of me. We defy gravity. And the next one is called Gypsy. It's my first time on a new trail along the river I hadn't explored before because my son always wants to take the short loop. I'm a meanderer like the water, following the path the earth has carved out, or is it the other way around? A dad and his son catch up to us. Their dog sniffs mine and they're off, leaving us behind to walk and talk the way only animals can bring people together suddenly and with no introduction. He is handsome, the dad. I noticed this right away, and my annoyance at no longer walking alone is replaced with curiosity. Who are you and what are we meant to be? The path splits, you follow me. The answer is nothing more than two people solo parenting for 15 minutes together, but I find myself fantasizing, the details filling in with each new fact. His son begins reciting directions to their house. The dad interrupts. She doesn't need to know exactly where we live. We laugh. Oh, but I do. Just so I can really get into it, this parallel life in which we all live together down the road to the left of Florence Pizza, they are putting in a pool and he is tall. This is all I need to take home and think about for a bit, throw a little gl glitter on the gray day. Why do I do this? Do you do it too? Hope for a connection? Wonder about another wife when your own life is what dreams are made of? I already have a love. My dad calls me gypsy because I'm always in motion. I guess now that I can't go anywhere, I move in my emotions. In the parking lot, the dog's leashes are all twisted in knots. We exchange numbers. It was his son's idea not mine. This next one is called For the Boys. I smell my son's hair because I know someday soon he won't let me. Last night I tried skiing for the first time in years. It's just like it used to be except I feel it in my knees and now I do not like that there is a boys private school arriving by bus. A pack of teens blitzed out on testosterone speeds by my fellow 45-year-old friend and me. Suddenly, we are sideways somehow, muffled laughter through hand-knit scarves, my heart pumping, and then one of the reckless, seemingly invincible boys nearly hits me, flailing, clearly his first time on skis, his friends urging him to make pizza. I freeze as he careens toward a line of trees at top speed, all arms and legs pointing in unnatural directions. He manages to stop somehow, 
and my heart starts up again. How many middle-aged moms must have held their breath watching me from the lift as I barreled down the mountain like anything was possible, 360 degree jumps at 13, a flash of teal green, the 80s, so no helmet, no hat, not cool. Long hair all twisted in knots as I race myself down the mountain, skidding sideways to a sudden stop, and then a rainbow of snow, a show for the boys. My boy leans against me now as he reads, pop at our feet, my heart. I brush his hair from his eyes and breathe him in. The second to last one is called, I am done being beautiful. I am done being beautiful. For so long, I've been wielding my looks like a weapon or cowering in a corner, clutching to my beauty as if it could save me. And it did at times, getting out of parking tickets with doe eyes. For too long, I blamed myself for another's pain inflicted upon me. I know it doesn't make sense at all, but people always saying she's so pretty and you've gotten so tall. I am done being beautiful in that certain expected way. Instead, I'm growing out my grays. I've given up my role in the show. She's let herself go. It's meant to be an insult, but doesn't it sound divine? And this last one is called longing. We walk along the river at my suggestion, hoping for a connection of some kind, some sign we're still on this path willingly. The ice is melting. Straw-colored hollow stalks of something once beautiful sway, give way to a duck passing through. Out of the blue appear two others, the hot dad I ran into recently and his son, the same age as ours. The dogs recognize each other and tug at their leashes. I feel a longing too, but it's not the new handsome man I yearn for, it's you. Thank you. Stunning, stunning, stunning work. Your power of observation, Elena, is just magnificent. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. All right, our last but not least reader, Jenny Chandler. Jenny grew up in the Berkshires and has been at home in the Pioneer Valley for six years. After 32 years as an independent school teacher and administrator, she's spending the first years of retirement writing a piece of fiction that draws from many of the school-based experiences and, and encounters she's had from a middle of the night knock on her apartment door as a first year teacher in rural Minnesota, to the reckoning faced by many boarding schools in light of the 2016 Boston Globe Spotlight Teams series on the abuse and harassment of students by faculty and staff at many New England boarding schools. A graduate of the College of Worcester and the Harvard Graduate School of Education, Jenny lives in Haydenville with her wife, Emma, they have two adult sons, Owen and Kyle. Everyone welcome Jenny. Hi everyone. So this is a work of fiction, <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> and I, I'm counting this, what I'm gonna read to you is the opening chapter uh, for the book. It's a work in progress, but um, so chapter one, it takes place January, 1982. Izzy glanced over at her roommate to check that she wasn't watching her count on her fingertips. Two weeks late, with so much more in her mind, she hadn't thought to miss her missing period, at least not until she saw the spotting. The unexpected relief did little to push away the real worry she carried. Her body felt hot, almost feverish. She tossed the blue ski bibs onto her bed and finished peeling off the long underwear. She shuddered when the room's cool air hit her damp skin. She'd been wearing the layers for hours, even at dinner when she'd sat down to meet with a teacher. How she was feeling, at least before she saw the splotch of blood, she chalked up to being overheated and tired. The team had won the race, not that she'd contributed anything, but she hadn't missed a gate this week. 
that was a record in itself and about as good as it got for the girls on the team. It's the combination of my period and three runs. That's all it is, she told herself. Even the cramping, the annoying ache in her side had come on during dinner. She wrapped a towel around her body and reached for the shower caddy on the top of the bureau. A sudden twinge in her side threw her off balance. Carol looked up from her desk as the contents of the caddy toppled to the floor. They watched a bottle of shampoo roll across the uneven floorboards. Carol said nothing and turned back to her work. The hurt of the silence between them was just another layer to add to what had already had, had begun to feel like a constant pulsating ache in her side. Even a biting reprimand would have felt kinder. Stretching her bare foot underneath Carol's bed, Izzy pulled back the wandering bottle, then repacked the caddy before slipping out into the hallway. Weeks earlier, they would have laughed as she tiptoed around, sneaking in a shower during study hall and daring the house proctor to write up another demerit. Taking a shower during study hall was a privilege reserved for seniors, and there were no seniors in this house. Being quiet now was about being small and unseen. It's not that she enjoyed keeping to herself, it's just where her instinct took her. The hot shower did little to soothe the ache. She began to imagine herself crawling into bed. Just let the day end, she thought, that's all I need. She exposed this, st this sticky tape on the pad and stuck it to her underwear before sitting down on the wooden bench in the changing alcove. A sharp pain ripped across her stomach and she bent over to dry her legs. It's just my period, she assured herself, just my period. She draped, she draped her nightgown on the sizzling radiator that sat below a frosted window. The girls knew it didn't keep the boys in the house next door from seeing their shadows or shield them from anyone who might be outside standing in the dark. She didn't care. She put the gown on and felt the warmth spread across her body, down her arms and all the way to her calves. She closed her eyes, hoping she could hold on to it just long enough to crawl into bed. All she could think about was lying down. She pulled her hair into a ponytail and promised herself, herself that she'd brush her teeth later. Carol didn't look up when she returned to the room. Izzy turned off her desk lamp. She didn't care that she hadn't finished her homework. I'll get up early, she told herself, but the effort to set her alarm felt like too much. I just need to lie down. She stretched her body long, flexed her back, and released her weight into the flimsy, narrow bed. She rubbed her feet together and tried to relax as her bedding transitioned from a shivering cold to a budding warmth. It helped a bit, or at least she imagined it did. The room was dark when she woke up, the house quiet, completely still. She flinched when the hot pipe between their desks banged. She'd grown accustomed to the familiar knocks and creaks of the old house, but wondered for a second if that's what had disturbed her. Then she felt it the flash of fire in her gut. The pain had grown worse. It was searing, almost unbearable. Her face felt flushed. I'm really sick, she thought. This wasn't some exaggerated nighttime worry. She knew what those were. She threw off the covers, exposing her legs to the cool air. She tugged at the neck of her nightgown and lifted her hips to untangle the mess that had bunched up at her waist. She trembled and pulled the covers back up. Keep breathing, she told herself. She looked over at Terrell's bed. Even in the soft light, she could see that she was on her stomach with her face turned away and her hands tucked under her chest. Izzy usually loved this time of night, pairing her own breathing with Terrell's as she listened for night sounds beyond the three windows that overlooked the quiet tree-lined street that separated student houses and faculty homes from the granite archway of the main campus. Nothing was soothing tonight. The windows rattled. She rolled over to see snow twirling in whisp wisps of cold air. The hot pipe banged again. Terrell stirred. Izzy continued to measure the pain in silence, wondering what to do. Is this what acute pain is like? She asked herself. She remembered when it had been a vocabulary word and they'd laughed about it. How can something that's hold up, Terrell had yelled, tapping her copy of Roger's with an index finger, be serious, critical, even grave? Be a cute. She pressed her elbows into her stomach as she sat up and put her feet on the cold floor. Terrell stirred again. Shit, she thought, I can't wake her, this is nuts. I must have food poisoning, but what? 
She'd avoided the congealed meatballs left out for too long by the time the team had returned to campus. It made her queasy just thinking about it, but a fever? She steadied herself and walked towards their door. The light in the hallway was dim. She panicked and stood frozen, wondering how she'd find her way and where she should go. The entrance to Dean Marshall's apartment was downstairs at the back of the house. She hated the idea of drawing attention to herself like this, but the pain was unlike anything she'd felt before. Her gut flared over and over like a wooden match head striking in sync with her pulse. Her hand found the smooth, chunky post at the top of the staircase. Alternating steps blew up the pain almost to the point of passing out. She imagined herself collapsing mid-step and landing in a heap at the bottom of the stairs. She gripped the railing and whispered, step, breathe, step, breathe, as she moved like an uneasy toddler. A flickering exit sign above the main door was the only light in the foyer, the space that opened up at the bottom of the staircase. She leaned against a wall to steady herself again and let her eyes adjust to the darkness. Her sweat-soaked nightgown was sticking to her back and chest. She realized she was panting and had tears streaming down her cheeks. She wanted to sob, to yell out in pain, but the urge to be quiet and not disrupt the house outweighed any impulse that would expose her. I just need to cool down, she thought. She saw an image of her mother pressing ice against her neck when, she had had, when she'd had a migraine. She scanned the mix of boots left to dry by the radiator at the front door. When she slipped her bare feet into hers and picked up a sweatshirt someone had left, she slipped her bare feet into hers and picked up a sweatshirt someone had left on the floor. It was oversized and had a musky smell of sweat and aftershave. She clenched her stomach before pressing down on the heavy latch and pushed the door open. The blast of cold air chilled her. Leaning out from the threshold, she closed her eyes and drew in mouthfuls of the snowy air whirling around the stoop. She slipped on the sweatshirt and stepped out onto the landing, easing the door closed with no more than a quiet click. The snow was feathery and barely covered the front steps and walkway. She bent down and cupped her hands, scooping up what she could and placing the tiny ball on the back of her neck and pressing her chilled hands against her forehead. The ache in her side throbbed again and hard this time, so hard she threw up. She looked down at the dark splash on the landing and brushed it away with her foot. Maybe that's all it was. Maybe now I can sleep, she thought. She turned to pull open the door. It didn't budge. She tugged on it. It was locked. Shit, she whispered. The pain slammed her again. She stumbled and braced herself against the door. The warning this time came from her stomach as panic began to meld with physical pain. She turned and vomited in the bushes. Her body felt disconnected and beyond her control. She worried that someone may have heard her. Being out after hours could get her kicked out of school, would get her kicked out of school. She couldn't pound on the door and wake the house. Jesus, why did I come outside? The pain and growing anguish felt punishing and deserved. She stepped away from the house and moved further into the dark. She looked up at the three stories of windows. No lights had come on and the house remained quiet and still. She'd never been so alone or so scared. Beautiful, beautiful work. Thank you so much, Jenny. I'm gonna bring back the other readers so we can move into our Q and A. Give me one second to do that. We have some great questions from the audience. So feel free to add more in the chat as you think of them. Wow, that was an amazing reading you all. That was fantastic. And I, I can't even believe like how perfect that quote was that I found. And I, you know, I didn't know these were gonna be your readings but this writing is so embodied. It's really amazing. And I guess I want to start with just throwing out a question about that. You know, like I think the most powerful writing is embodied and it really does come to the reader through the senses. And so 
I'm just curious, um, anybody that wants to jump in about sort of like how you do that, if you have any practices or techniques for embodying your writing, if you um, practice mindfulness or, you know, is this just a, a natural um, propensity? Anybody want to jump in? Amelia, I'll pick on you first. Okay, let's see, I, mean, I was like, I, I feel like I should have a practice. I mean, I think, I don't know, just knowing this group, I think it comes pretty naturally. Like there's just sort of a sense of like the feeling. Um, I don't know. I mean, I definitely will sometimes do weird things when blocked with writing, like where I'll just like walk and walk and walk or like dance or like, you know, yell, sing, hit a pillow, you know, whatever, what, like it does feel like the body is a key part of like mm -hmm. the vehicle. Yeah. And actually, I'll just say quickly, the first thing I ever took at Writers in Progress was Emily's writing from the body which is actually such a beautiful introduction to that practice of like mm -hmm. find the feeling in the body and then untangle it somehow on the page. Well, and I'm going to move from there to a, a, a question specifically for you, um, Amelia, and then I want to hear from the other writers about, about your own writing practice. And when did writing become part of your practice? One of the questions that Emily asked is, about your rich um, history of spiritual and, and religious studies, but has writing always been part of that for you, a part of sort of like your practice of going deeper? I mean, honestly, writing has always been a part of my life. If it's been a practice, it's been a practice since I started Writers in Progress, because honestly, writing alone can be so painful. But I was just, I saw that question in the chat and I was remembering like being like six, and thinking like I just learned the word memoir and thinking like I've lived so much I should I need to write it down <laughs> and just like you using writing as a way to, to like make sense of things and also actually as a way to like channel the feelings like to put them somewhere I think has always been really helpful for me but I, I haven't used it particularly as like a part of my spiritual practice necessarily but so I'm endlessly grateful to writers in progress for creating that <laughs> Like, I feel like it's like you need a container somehow to like let the creativity flow. And sometimes that yeah, is it is very isolating and scary sometimes doing it alone. But thank you, Victoria. Yeah, um, I find that writing is so therapeutic. Like I've always kept journals and written really bad, depressing poetry starting at eight years old. But um, a lot of it comes to me uh, 3 a.m. in the morning, like images or people or characters. And it's just lying there still in the darkness and something will come up. And that's when I get up and I write it down. And uh, so I kind of wait for that. I kind of like, come on, muse, come and visit. So um, that works for me. And for you, Victoria, I, I, I know that you have a, a background in theater and performance, right? And your yes. piece was so much about that. I mean, it was so visceral. It was so incredibly sensory. I, I'm wondering um, how much your theater background influences the way you write and the, and the themes that you write about. Um, not so much the themes, uh, for sure, the piece that I chose tonight was, was obviously a theme from um, a show and that was inspired from a photo that I took backstage in a dressing room of that production cabaret. And I just had an image and that's where the story came from. Mm -hmm. But I think what um, performance theater has given me is the pace of a story, mm -hmm. um, the structure of a story. It's like in a performance, you can sort of have a fabulous opening, you can sort of drift along for a while. And the, but the, the audience will forgive you if your finale is unbelievable, like you wrap up the story and, and end strong. But if, you're, if your finale sucks the big one, the whole story just nobody cares, right? Yeah. So the structure of that the ending just has to just grab you and make the, the largest impact. So it's wow. the, yeah, it's the pace of the story that is very similar to a performance for me. That's a great lesson for, for writing too, you know? Thank you. Um, 
Jenny, I I know that you from from having you in my workshops that your um, Izzy is only one of your protagonists, right? You have several perspective characters in this mm -hmm. amazing book, and I'm I was just so curious listening to you about how you get in, into the minds of all these different characters. You know, some of them male, some of them female, and, and they're all so embodied. They're all so kind of sensory. So I, I'm just really curious about what your process is. You know, do you know what day you're going to be writing from which character's perspective, and how does that work for you? Oh, I wish it could be that, or I could be that organized <laughs> story. Um, I'm re I'm often really in anxious, and I think there are other people in the Monday group who share this tremendous anxiety on Monday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then I open up my Zoom at seven, and I'm so inspired by by the work that we all do. And then I'm I I really love Tuesdays because I feel generally pretty motivated to have at it um i've always been regarded myself as a very good listener and i pay attention um introverted person so i i think deeply about my characters and they're not they're not necessarily based on anybody they're not but they are a com composite of, of things i've witnessed i was i worked at the girls boarding school for quite a while i know a lot of izzy's i can imagine um, what that fear is like. I've also been a girl, you know, a teen, you know, I was a teenager. Oh. Um, my other, my other character is the teacher um, and Jay. And I really love trying to capture the male perspective mm -hmm. in this, in this situation that is, that is um, happening at this school. Mm -hmm. um, and a sympath, I'd like to think a very sympathetic male character mm -hmm. kind of that perspective do you do any sort of exercises to to get into those perspectives or i mean do you do you spend time kind of imagining what they might dream about or write in their journal or do you just like dive right mm -hmm. into the story mm, that's such a good question i probably should do that dory <laughs> I, I I really find I take my dogs for a long walk. I usually get the morning walk and I just really kind of am planful and I often think about one of the characters. I'll have my phone with me and I'll record. If I think of something, I'll record it. Mm -hmm. Kind of this is how Izzy would react to that or this is what Jay experienced, those two characters in particular. Mm -hmm. um, but um, still struggling to find a process and to be a little more disciplined. But um Many of, us, done. many of us yeah, I know that's not yeah I know that's common yeah, yeah and self-doubt and all of that so of course thank you and thank Elena you. um I wanted to ask you a question about your your themes came this came up uh in the chat your themes seem to be a lot about desire aging and longing um they're so great and so relatable there was such honesty in your work I wondered if you've always been interested in those themes or um, is that something that you've started writing about recently? Well, aging only since I <laughs> <laughs> I'm over 40. Um, but I was thinking about that when I saw that question, because I seem to only write about very intimate things that then when we have a reading such as this, like I said, I'm like, oh, let me pick the most benign things. But people always want the more intimate pieces because hopefully like you said Dory people can relate but I think I write about the gray areas of life like the desire and longing and I love to I'm just drawn to writing about the things that people don't usually talk about like being married and then going on a walk and finding some other married man hot or woman whatever it is we live in such a black and white society that, you know, like that is a negative thing. But then when I get something positive out of it, that is totally benign and isn't harming anybody and actually feeds my own relationship in some way. I don't know. It's just, that's just an example from one of the pieces. I just love, I think I write about those experiences because people don't usually talk about those experiences. And so that's my outlet to kind of process those more intimate gray area moments. I love that. And because, it, because it's not something that people generally talk about, it's really refreshing 
to read it or to hear it read, you know, to hear these um, these things talked about in, a, in such a frank way. I loved that. Um, well, I don't want to keep uh, everybody too long, but does anyone else in the audience have a question that, that they're just dying to, to ask? You can unmute yourself and go for it. I don't want to hog all the airtime here. All right. Well, I just adored this reading. I was absolutely riveted by these readings. My mind didn't wander at all. And I think part of that was just how immediate and visceral your writing is. So whatever you guys are doing, keep doing it. <laughs> it's working. Um, I wanna just give a little shout out to some workshops that are coming up um, through Writers in Progress. Uh, if you're interested, there's some great offerings coming up. Jacqueline, I think, is in the audience. Um, Jacqueline Sheehan, who's been uh, teaching with us for a long time and just does such a wonderful job and uh, is our, our resident New York Times bestselling author. And she's doing a workshop on research and backstory coming up at the end of April. Um, she's also doing one on allies and antagonists. And um, she's just great. So if you haven't had the pleasure of taking a workshop with Jacqueline, you should get in there. Um, and Emily is also teaching a couple of, of morning workshops this spring, one on finding an agent, one on getting published with Emily Everett. Um, there's a writing young adult fiction workshop coming up in May um, with Jacqueline's wonderful daughter, Morgan Sheehan Bubla. Did I say her name right, Jacqueline? Yes, okay. Um, and she's she's she does a really great job with that. If anyone's curious about the world of young adult fiction writing, um, Morgan does a great job giving an introduction to that and kind of getting people going on their own ideas. And then Suzanne Dunlap is gonna be back with her mini blueprint, blueprint your book series. So you can check those out on our website, writersinprogress.com. Um, and thank you all so much for coming to this. Thank you so much to you readers for your gorgeous and very inspiring work. Um, and I'm just so grateful to be part of this community. And thank you, Emily, <laughs> for hosting and for teaching such a great workshop on Monday nights that this work is coming out of. My pleasure. Thanks everyone who can make it and be here. It was wonderful seeing you all. And Emily, do you still have uh, openings coming up in your weekly groups? My Wednesday night group has a spot. It still has one spot left. So if you're looking for inspiration and accountability and support, it's a really great group. I highly recommend it. <laughs> great. That'll go fast. So if you're interested, grab it. Um, and thank you all for coming. We had a great audience. I think there was over 50 people here at one point. So that was pretty exciting. You guys were a big draw. Um, and I will see you all soon in a, in a workshop or in the studio, hopefully. Thank you, Dory. Thank, Thank you, you Emily. So much. Thank you, Jacqueline. Hi, everyone. Beautiful Thank Monday beauty. night. <laughs> Thank you. Gorgeous writing. Gorgeous readings from everyone. Absolutely. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, you all. It's great to see your faces.